from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, I am Rob Casper. I am the head of the Poetry and Literature Center at the Library of Congress, and I am delighted to welcome you uh, this, evening, this afternoon uh, to a presentation by Sasha Pullman titled uh, Walt Whitman's Future Founding Poetry. If you, if you wondered what you were coming in for, you could see by the video screens and the man himself. Uh, before we begin, though, let me ask you to turn off your cell phones or any electronic devices that you have, um, as it can interfere with the recording. Uh, this is a very exciting event today for me personally because this marks the first time the Poetry and Literature Center has partnered with the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about both centers. The Kluge Center was established uh, through a generous endowment by D John W. Kluge to create a scholarly venue on Capitol Hill and to foster a mutually enriching relationship between scholars and political leaders. To that end, the center is home to both the Kluge Scholars, a group of the world's best senior thinkers, as well as a large and thriving program for fellows such as Dr. Pullman. It provides research opportunities as well as presenting seminars, small conferences, and lectures like the one this afternoon. The Poetry and Literature Center is home to the nation's poet laureate consultant in poetry, and it also presents an annual literary season of public poetry, fiction, and drama readings, performances, lectures, and symposia. Uh, we have a sign-up sheet outside uh, in, the, in the room as well as a little bit of information on both the Kluge Center and the Poetry and Literature Center. You can pick it up and you can sign up for our sign-up sheet to find out more about events like this. You can also give visit our website at www.loc.gov www and you can uh, check out both, both centers. Uh, if you don't have it already marked on your calendar, uh, you should mark down uh, December 20th, which is next Thursday, for our next noontime event, the last one of the year, I believe, um, featuring Black Mountain Fellow Kelly Groom talking about her new memoir, The Quiet People, Hildjanin. Did I do okay with that? Hildjanin Kanza. Uh, but let's talk about our uh, featured speaker for today, Sasha Pullman. Uh, he is a lecturer in American literary history at Ludwig. L Ludwig Maximilian's Universität in Munich, Germany. Uh, he received his MA degree in uh, Beirut University in 2004 and continued to work there as a lecturer until 2007. He completed his PhD at LMU Munich in 2008 with a thesis that won the annual dissertation award of the Bavarian American Academy. His studies also took him to Trinity College Dublin and the University of Illinois in Chicago, and he has taught at Weber State University and the Universities of Odense, Warsaw, and Cordoba. Dr. Pullman is the author of Pynchon's Post-National Imagination and the editor of Against the Grain, Reading Pynchon's Counter-Narratives. He is currently working on future founding poetry, topographies of beginnings from Whitman, uh, to the 21st century as a member of the DFG research group, Beginnings in of Modernity. And he's also editing a volume of essays on Mark Z. Daniel, Danieleski. A lot, of, a lot of tough names. Um, he's going to talk specifically about Whitman uh, uh, for about a half hour. Then we're going to have a little conversation. Uh, and then we'll open up the, open up the uh, 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 event to questions from you. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Sasha Pullman. Thank you, Rob. Can you all hear me okay? Is that okay? You can, you can see all right, you can hear, all the senses are in well. Okay, um, let me get my little clock here started so I'm not gonna bother you for too long. Um, I prepared a presentation but I did not bring a manuscript because I thought it might be easier to listen to me if I talk that way. Um, so if there's any parts I'm gonna skip over because I'm running out of time or if I suddenly lose track of what I'm actually saying, I apologize in advance. Um, um, I would also like, first of all, to, to thank the people at the Kluge Center who've been really kind in the last five months. And I found it a, a wonderful place to do research in. And this is part of um, what I've been doing here, a part of the project I'm working on. And I will try to give you a very general idea of what it is I'm doing, what it is I'm, I'm interested in when it comes to Whitman. Um, 
and I, I've tried to make it a, in a way general and hopefully interesting. Um, so thank you again for the time at the Kluge Center. I really appreciated it. Um, there was a moment when I arrived that I had dreaded for a few weeks before, and that was the first time looking into the Library of Congress catalog, entering the search term Walt Whitman, <laughs> and seeing what would come up. Um, and so I did that, and it was 2,400 entries, um, which is not only not just individual items, but of course groupings like that. You're shaking your head. It's, it looks like you're, you know that there's a lot more behind that. than just, That's just the regular entries. In the, in the catalog, it's not individual items. So I thought, okay, let's get to work. And then halfway through, I found out that some of the items had been mixed up with not Whitman, Walt, but Disney, Walt. And there was actually something, <laughs> like Steamboat Willie came up. Um, it must have been the Walt that the search thing. Um, so unfortunately, this is not going to be a talk about the two Walts, and it's not going to be a comparison of Disney and Whitman. It was just going to be about Whitman. And it will be about Whitman's future founding poetry, and I will tell you about something about the term and what I plan to do with it or how I want to theorize it. It's a term that is taken from um, a line of Whitman's, let's see if this works, from his preface to the 1876 edition of Leaves of Grass, where he is describing uh, what he has been doing in the decades before. I hope you can read this all right. And he said, Finally, as I have lived in fresh lands and coets, and in a revolutionary age, future founding, I have felt to identify the points of that age, these lands, in my recitatives, all together in my own way. It's a programmatic statement. It's written in the past tense because Whitman at that time fully expected to die within the next few months. Uh, he didn't. He lived for quite, quite a number of years, but that is why it's written in the past tense. And this is the only time he's using that term, future founding. And I found it wonderfully appropriate as a single term to unite a few concepts that I think apply to his poetry in particular, but also to the poetry of other poets in the 20th and 21st century. So I'm kind of maybe stealing it from him, taking it away from him, and I thought, what, do we, what can I do with this? What can we understand this, this term for? What is it like? And I came up with a few ideas about what it means to be future founding, what it means to do future founding, and I want, want to present those ideas to you. They're all connected to Whitman's poetry, and I would argue in general that he is the greatest beginner in American poetry, and that he was concerned with beginnings much more than anyone else. And with this idea of beginnings, I connect this idea of future founding, and this is, these are some of the theories and ideas I want to present to you today. If I had to define what future founding poetry is, what I've kind of extracted from Whitman's poetry and also other people's, is that it's poetry that aims to actively mark and perform a beginning that is relevant to both the present and the future. It is about beginnings, but it's also making a beginning. And that is a quality that is, has not really been recognized um, by many critics. Um, one of the first books of, of, about um, William Carlos Williams in the US that was applying, it's called the inverted bell, applying Derrida's deconstructionist ideas to it is allegedly about beginnings, but you couldn't tell from the text because nobody can read it. It's hard to read. <laughs> Impossible. If you want to take a look at that, it's really interesting. But, and that's, that's about it. This whole idea of beginnings that is so crucial to modernity um, is quite under, underrepresented. And I thought using this term of future founding is a way of getting at what is a beginning? What does it mean to make a beginning, to perform one? And what is the symbolic quality of that? Also the political quality. I'll get to that. Now, Whitman, from the first preface to the first edition of Leaves of Grass, was all about beginnings and um, all about this idea of founding a future. He wrote, let the age and wars of other nations be chanted and their eras and characters be illustrated and that finish the verse. Not so the great psalm of the Republic. Here, the theme is creative and has vista. Here comes one among the well-beloved stonecutters and plans with decision and science and sees the solid and beautiful forms of the future where there are no, now no solid forms. This is basically the relation he sees between the present and the future. It is something that is actively formed now, but it is something that is at the same time not determined. It has to remain creative. That is one important part about this notion of future founding, that you have to keep founding it. It's not something you do once and for all. I'll get to those details later. He, um, 
if you want to summarize it from a line of, uh, in a poem by Blue Ontario Shore, which is basically a self-plagiarism of the first preface he wrote, he said it was about leading the present with friendly hand toward the future. This is another way of understanding what the concept of future founding means. Um, a review, uh, in a review of Leaves of Grass, somebody wrote, if in this poem the United States have found their poetic voice and taken measure and form, is it any more than a beginning? Walt Whitman himself disclaims singularity in his work and announces the coming after him of great successions of poets and that he but lifts his finger to give the signal. So this reviewer already identified Whitman as um, a poet of beginnings, as a beginner that would already declare that others would come after him. And he's not really being done with it once and for all, but he wants to start something. The reason why he was um, so smart about recognizing this is that the review was written by Whitman himself, <laughs> anonymously. Um, <laughs> which he did a lot, actually, and was full of praise. It was really amazing. Um, if you're looking for the, the first you know, PR people and marketing people and you know, artists who knew how to sell themselves, that was, that was him. He also began that, I think. There's a picture I, fought, I found called Whitman toasting himself that I'm showing you just as an illustration of that, and also because I think the dog just looks so wonderful. This is one of the, the caricatures you can find on. You know, he's very much toasting himself, and he actually did that in the review. <laughs> but he is stressing, if you want to use that review as a kind of comment on his own work, he is stressing this, uh, this idea of beginnings and that he's making that. Now, let me move on to a poem that also indicates the trouble with what he was doing. This long, long hence published in um, the last edition in 1891, this is also the deathbed edition. It's called Long, Long Hence, and it illustrates a point that came under a lot of fire from critics, even, you know, even today. And that is, um, I'll just read it out to you, and you may see what the problem is. He wrote, after a long, long course, hundreds of years, denials, accumulations, rude love and joy and thought, hopes, wishes, aspirations, ponderings, victories, myriads of readers, coding, compassing, covering, after ages and ages and crustaceans, then only may these songs reach fruition. What he's doing is, he's basically saying, um, all this might be postponed. All this, what I'm pro proclaiming, the democracy, America, as a kind of perfect utopian place where in individual and democracy can be reconciled, that may actually only happen 200 years from now, or ages and ages from now. And this is... One way of describing it is given by Terence Martin in Parables of Possibility, The American Need for Beginnings, one of, one of the few studies on beginnings in American studies. He writes that Whitman always found, uh, found a way to always wipe the slate clean whenever events corroded the promise of America. Basically what he's saying is Whitman had an idea of what America should be like, and whenever America failed to correspond to that idea, he said, oh yeah, that's just... It's just a minor problem. You know, we're not really there yet. We're only just beginning. We will come along. The Civil War was quite a big event that did just that for him, right? He was writing about how you know, it was you know, the brotherhood of men and um, America, this utopian place, and suddenly this utopian place is tearing itself apart. And he was right in the middle of it here in DC, actually. And so the idea, what he did was he simply reinscribed that war as another beginning. Always start again and again and again. And of course, you can see that's also a way to cop out, right? It's not really addressing the problem, but it's simply postponing it and says, oh, we'll be fine. And this is, I'm just paraphrasing what many critics have been saying about it. It's also lines like this from Democratic Vistas, 1871, where he says, the fruition of democracy on not like a grand scale resides altogether in the future. And that, of course, is a problem because he is postponing success and this place he envisions um, completely from the present. And that was his way of dealing with the inequities of the present. And this is something that many critics have been addressing. And I'll just give you a brief list of a number of major critics who have been uh, criticizing Whitman for doing that pretty much after the Civil War. David Reynolds writes that Whitman claims American salvation lies in the intermediate future. He says it's, he's carrying out a deferral of possibilities. Betsy Urkula is writing, Whitman is posed for the flight into spiritual seas that became his characteristic renunciatory gesture as America's political failure became increasingly apparent in the post-Civil War period. 
and Amwin Thomas saying that Whitman was basically building the cloud castles of the future, that he took flight disastrously to the future, that he was creating the fool's paradise of hope deferred to infinitely future prospects, and that Whitman basically dwindled from a poet into a mere prophet. And I could go on and on and on. This is a thing that critics often, often write about and basically say there was a, a good beginning Whitman and then there was the Whitman that was building these cloud castles. And I think this does not really do justice to what he's doing. And this is where the idea of future founding comes in. He's not really postponing anything. But I think if you take the idea of a beginning seriously, and if you use the term future founding to describe that beginning if you want, I think um, what he's been doing is a lot more relevant to the present than many critics actually recognize. Um, because he's not just dreaming about a future, but he's also voicing those dreams. And they're not really dreams in the sense of cloud castles, but they're sometimes you know, very much you know, full of symbolic value, and that has a significance to the present. So it's not like he was, it's not escapism, basically. But I would argue that he was beginning, and we have to recognize his acts of poetry and also prose as linguistic and symbolic acts of beginning. That's what he did. And I think that... I, I hope you get the sense that this is a lot more relevant than what other critics have, have um, read in him. And this is why I would rather describe uh, his, what he's doing as future founding. Now let me give you five different ideas of what is contained in that term, and I hope it makes you see that it's not at all only about having weird dreams about the future, but that it does have a very high significance for the present and the political and aesthetic present too. Future founding is not concerned with the future alone, but also connects it to the present. That's implied in the term itself. And the future is not something to come, but it is something that is formed now. It's, this is a philosophical concern that I think bears relevance to many of the fields, and also many of the fields that other fellows at the Kluge Center are working in. It's basically the question, how do we think about the future? What is our idea of the future? Is it simply something that will happen and we can't do anything about? Or is it something that can be formed into the present? And if so, to what extent? It does not simply celebrate the new, which is kind of a, an American cliche. Right? American newness is, is one, of those, one of those stereotypes. And future founding is not just about that. And beginnings are not just about creating the new over and over again. You can also begin and begin again. And there's going to be little new in that. It's not they're not synonymous. And that's also very important. It also emphasizes sustainability. You need to be able to found the future again and again and again. It's not done once and for all. That's what uh, the form of the verb, the present participle, is. The founding of the future is a continued and iterative, repeatable process of cultivation rather than a single act. And this is what Whitman has been doing throughout his career. Um, you could even argue that his working on Leaves of Grass over and over again instead of publishing another book might be just that, it's reworking this constant cultivation of what he's been doing. Um, in general, philosophically, it tries to balance between the uncertain and the determined. Future founding does not mean future determining. It's not something that will determine what will happen, but it's setting a framework for it. And this is an important negotiation. Um, if things are too uncertain, even Whitman would agree that this is something you're rather more scared of than, than satisfied by. But if things are too determined, um, you don't need to do anything about it. That's one of those uh, places where critics are wondering about, for example, how political was Whitman, actually. Did he accept things as they are? Was he simply somebody who said the status quo was wonderful, um, including slavery and all that? And then you find very political passages in, in his poetry that actually say, no, we need to do something about it. So it was not this kind of um, acceptance of things as they are, but the desire to change them. The term combines a, a temporal and a spatial dimension. The founded future is in place. Foundation is something that occurs in a place. And that is an aspect uh, I can't really emphasize here, but I, I find it in uh, much of his poetry that he's not just creating beginnings, but also places of beginnings, symbolic places. Um, sometimes they're highly local. Sometimes they're national, like America, for example. And there's critics arguing that he created that place in the first place. And sometimes it's the globe. So this idea of space and place comes into, into the idea, too. I'll give you a few examples of that later on. 
And the term emphasizes the performative and social aspects of founding the future. It's not something that just happens. It is something that is performed socially. The future is formed by groups. It's a political thing. It's aesthetic, too. But for Whitman, I think, aesthetics and politics were not altogether different at all. And I think this is, this is one thing we need to recognize about his poetry, that it is aesthetic as well as political. And so is future founding. Um, now, these are just five, five different ideas of how I would describe what I call future founding poetry. And I can give you some ideas of how Whitman um, actually did it. He is um, often described by critics such as Kenneth Price as a foundational figure in American culture. He is, when we write the history of American literature, he is placed at the beginning of American poetry. And of course, you could immediately get up and throw a chair and say, Emily Dickinson or whoever. But it's not so much a question of dating that, but it's a question of how did he actually get there? And I'll give you a few ideas of how you know, his own PR and his marketing basically put him there, which is another way of founding the future, and that is a gesture of erasure, of simply eradicating anything that had come before him so he could make that fresh new start. Um, just a few more ideas that you know, Malcolm Colley said before Walt Whitman, America hardly existed which is also something that you know, Whitman worked hard to, to sell to people. Ezra Pound said that Whitman is America. His crudity is an exceeding great stench, but it is America. <laughs> I, he, he went on and on and on. It's, a, it's really, um, it's hard to tell how much he liked him from that essay. He's kind of celebrating him, and at the same time, he's saying all these very bad things about him. Uh, Phil Fisher, uh, in the book called Still the New World, said, Whitman is a grounding fact for all later American culture, as Homer was for Greek culture or Shakespeare became for England. So when we're talking about the foundation of the future and about creating that foundation, Whitman was really um, excellent at creating himself and his own poetry as that foundation. And critics writing about him like that actually show that this foundation is a recognized one. Um, R.W.B. Lewis in American Adam says that there's scarcely a poem of Whitman's before, say, 1867, which does not have the air of being the first poem ever written. And I'll give you a few ideas of how Whitman actually achieved that. For example, by claiming in Democratic Vistas, a bit later than that, by saying that America has yet morally and artistically originated nothing. And in 1871, that's quite a bold statement to make, actually. Um, well, this is the gesture of erasure, simply denying the relevance of anything that had come before. You also have to consider that to him the term originate really meant something that was originally from America. And he would say that all the poetry that has been written before him was basically British. And that um, people like Longfellow just didn't write American enough. And so this is part of the statement, but it's also this, this gesture of the clean sheet. In a poem called To the Prevailing Bards, he claimed that I am he standing first there, solitary chanting the true America. This, is, this parallels this, this um, statement from Democratic Vista, simply performing this beginning and saying, I am the first. I'm here. This is me. I'm going to begin this. And in Poetry Today in America, he's describing what he's doing by saying, the poetry of the future aims to arouse and initiate more than to define or finish. And this is, I think, it really relevant to this idea of future founding and beginning, that he would never consider um, the project of poetry to be finished. His political project, his aesthetic project, it needed to be open-ended, like the democracy he envisioned. And this is something that is a core part of his poetry, to keep this openness alive and cultivated, right? which is a hard thing to do. It's the problem of democracies everywhere. right? How do you, how do you maintain an open society? And this is something that he addressed aesthetically and um, politically. And I want to show you how he did it by taking a look finally at this book here. Um, there's, um, if you want to take a look at the real ones, you know, I, they're, they're right here. So I encourage you to go there and freak the people out in the, in the room so, because you're asking for a bunch of them. Um, this is the way he presented himself, and you've surely seen this. I'm going over familiar territory here. This is the way he presented himself in the first edition of Leaves of Grass. No name on the cover, but just this little copyright notice to a Walter Whitman inside, and his, his name is mentioned only in a late part of Song of Myself. 
And this is how he presented himself as a new poet, as a new beginning for American poetry. There's this wonderful argument that says the simple fact that he didn't have three names like all the, the intellectuals of his time, <laughs> Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David, etc., etc., but he was just Walt, already indicates that this was something new. And the way he presents himself, you know, the you know, hat to the side and these laborious clothes indicated that this was not your regular, regular poet. This was a new age that was about to begin. Um, I think we have to compare this gesture, you know, in, in the sense of you know, socially, sim social symbolism to the long hair of the Beatles and just the, the radical cool stuff, basically. He was throwing it out there. And this was the way he would present himself, saying, no, this is, this is where American poetry is going to come from. Aesthetically, he wrote in his notebooks that every great artist, poet, etc., will be found to have some precursors or first beginners of his greatness. Doubtless Homer had, though we know them not. And at the same time, he also wrote, make no quotations and no reference to any other writers. <laughs> and <laughs> so he's, in his notebooks, he's acknowledging that, of course, there's a background. Of course, there's influence. Of course, there is, you know, nobody, nobody just shows up like he looks like in that picture. And he gives the impression of, you know, he's just built a house somewhere with his bare hands. And then in the evening, he just writes a few poems. Nobody does that. He was an intellectual, too. I mean, he, was, he worked as a printer. He was a journalist. Um, but it was about the impression he wanted to give and about this construction of the self as a beginner, that this making no quotations and simply no reference to other, other writers achieved those beginnings and gave readers this idea that this is something completely out of context, a new foundation for the future, basically. Um, it didn't have this guy fooled, which is Emerson, because he wrote the famous letter, which has been called the Gettysburg Address of American Literature, which he wrote famously, I greet you at the beginning of a great career, which yet must have had a long foreground somewhere for such a start. So um, Emerson wasn't quite sure about all this newness, and I think you, know, you have to credit him with that. And, um, there's been, you know, some critics spend their, spend their time wondering how Whitman could have come up with that poetry with all the bad stories he had written before. It's like, how did he become such a great writer? So this is also an issue of beginnings critics are concerned with. I'm not one of them. I'm not so much interested in that biographical transition he made. But this is, again, another um, idea of beginning where the beginnings have been in doubt. But I think he pulled it off. And he kept making those beginnings in later editions of Leaves of Grass. I mean, you can always make a fresh start with the first edition, but the second is quite a different thing, right? And what do you do with the deathbed edition, right? And, few, and Whitman, I would argue, was able to mark and perform those beginnings and write future founding poetry even until the last edition, which is very open-ended. Now, let me just give you two examples. One of them is Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, a poem that I basically chose because it's an audience favorite usually, and not so much because it's the perfect future founding poem, but it's one of those where you can illustrate a few of the things that Whitman is doing. Um, and I'll just, um, I'm, you probably all, all know the poem. It is about what the title says, and um, it's basically bridging a gap between the present, Whitman's present, and the future of his readers. For example, in stanzas like that, which you can't read because the presentation is messed up. But never mind, I'll try to read it out to you anyway. It avails not, time nor place, distance avails not. I am with you, you men and women of a generation or ever so many generations hence. Just as you feel when you look on the river and sky, so I felt. Just as any of you is one of a living crowd, I was one of a crowd. Just as you are refreshed by the gladness of the river and the bright flow, I was refreshed. Just as you stand and lean on the rail, yet hurry with a shift, uh, with a swift current, sorry, I stood, yet was hurried. Just as you look on the numberless masts of ships and the thick stem pipes of steamboats, I looked. He's establishing a community of perception in these stanzas. And the interesting thing about it is that he's doing so even though he is, the two realities do not correspond. There are some critics who argued that Whitman hated the Brooklyn Bridge so much because it messed up his poem. Right? <laughs> it's, 
you know, just, just imagine you're writing a, a poem celebrating the, the bus that gets you to Dallas Airport and they build the metro. And it's a bit like, it's not that far-fetched actually because he was probably the first writer ever to write about public transport and um, people on that boat e didn't even have any business being there. I mean, they're not even commuting. It's just, you know, just being there basically. But the way it's constructed and the way it works is that it does establish a community of perception because it's not comparing realities. It's determining a reality. The things he describes, he's, not, he's presenting that reality to the reader and makes them perceive him through the poem. He doesn't ask us to compare what we see when we cross Brooklyn Ferry in 2011. He's not saying, you know, look what you're doing, and I'm, I've been doing the same, but he is telling you what you are perceiving. And there's a big difference. Because in a way, that can never fail. Because reading the poem makes you relate to that perception. He's framing your perception by simply offering it to you in the text, right? And that's an important difference. And I would argue that this is one way of actually founding that future of the reader. There's a later line where he says um, that I might have, uh, that he has been preparing for the reader and that he might even be watching right now, which sometimes reads a little threatening, actually. Um, but of course, that's also what happens. Because the text is always read in the present, and it cannot not be read in the present. And Whitman is employing this you, the pronoun, to great effect too, because it always speaks to the present individual. And it will always be. There will always be a you there as long as somebody's reading the poem. And that is one way of constructing what he's doing, of constructing perception for a future readership that maintains a validity in the, in the future but at the same time keeps it open. It's not a local poem in the sense of limited to a certain time. It's not something you read if you want to know what it was like to write Brooklyn Ferry. It's useless when it comes to that. Actually, he wrote a wonderful piece of journalism complaining about the idiots on Brooklyn Ferry and how they misbehave and they're just horrible people. <laughs> and <laughs> it's really mean and actually very funny. I encourage you to look it up. But this poem is nothing like that. It's, it's not about the real thing, but it's about offering a perception and comparing it to something that happened maybe 200 years before. And that is a way of constructing and founding a future and keeping it open nevertheless. In a way, you could argue the poem will never become dated or outdated. Um, since I'm basically at the end of my time, I will skip over this poem and end with some comments of um, critics and, and philosophers that do relate to something that Whitman has been doing, and that's something that frames my work. I will start with Whitman, and I'm, I'm finishing with poetry on 9-11, which is one of those instances where a lot of poetry has been written, I would consider future founding, where this mode of writing and the concern of, about the future is really coming to the fore and becomes really important to writers. Basically, the question of how do we begin again? Can we begin again? Is the beginning still possible? And there's various ways of responding to that. But one of those things that philosophically have been addressed, for example, by Alain Badiou in an essay called Philosophy and the War Against Terrorism, is now it is essential to break with the omnipresent motif of finitude, of endings. And that is something future founding works against. It is against nostalgia, but also against the sense of, of endings, which have dominated the discourse on 9-11 as much as a sense of new beginnings. And this is, this is one way of um, the poetry found to deal with this omnipresent motif of finitude, to say, well, let's see if we can find, find a new future. And not all poems answer the question you know, in a positive way. And some say, we can't. This is it. Others do. Other critics like Alan Gilbert in a book called Another Future Looking at Poetry says that there are hopeful modes of reading that read less for an idealized tomorrow, something that Whitman has been accused of, but for, for a utopian spark or for a romanticized past than for an ongoing resistance to the inequities of any present. And I think this is in a nutshell what Whitman has been doing when it came to his future founding ideas and this is what I would also describe as the core idea of future founding in general, an ongoing resistance to the inequities of any present, and the uh, imagination of a future uh, 
is one of the central and core tools and, and locations where this will actually happen. Now, coming back to him, um, he wrote something um, that relates quite directly to that in his notebooks, saying that a main part of the greatness of humanity is that it never at any time or under any circumstances arrives at its finality. Never is able to say, now as I stand, I am fixed forever. If anyone has the feeling to say, I am fixed, and retains that feeling, then a longer or shorter farewell to the greatness of that humanity. So he is precisely resisting this, this motif of finality, of endings, and says it has to be cultivated in its openness, and that is something he has been doing in his poetry. And that is why the deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass ends in, with a line in a poem that says, the strongest and sweetest songs yet remain to be sung. And if that's the way to end your poetic oeuvre, basically, this means that he has maintained this future founding impulse, even to the point where he knew there was not much coming. Leaves of Grass is interesting in that respect because it has an ending. Then Whitman didn't die, so he wrote an annex. And then he didn't die again, so he wrote a second annex. <laughs> so, um, and the book has a section of beginnings that I think contains 24 poems. So he really has a hard time beginning the damn thing. And then he has an ha even harder time ending it. And it just, it just, he has to postpone those endings. And that's really an interesting quality of his, of his poetry. And with that, I think I will end my presentation. Thank you. So I think we're going to we'll share a microphone a little let's, bit. Let's do that. I think there's yeah. another one here. Is there another one? Well, there's that one. This is working. No, I think it's we not. have to sort of use this okay. one. I can kind of Maybe I, if I talk real loud. Well, let's get it so that you can, uh, so it that has you to can be recorded. Record it. Of course. Um, thank you for that great talk. Yeah. And, thank um, you. Uh, I'm interested. I just have a few questions, and we'll, we'll open up open up to questions for you from the audience. Um, I wanted to talk about the um, uh, um, relationship uh, uh, between aesthetics and politics that you talked about, uh, mm -hmm. and the fact that you said for Whitman it's the same. Uh, and I wondered, uh, is it is is the what you define as future founding founding always something that is topical? Is it always a, mm -hmm. a, a, something that the poet is addressing, mm -hmm. and how do poets address it? If it is, how do poets address it in unique ways that are different than how fiction writers address right. it? Or even, as you said, um, someone called Whitman a mere prophet. Mm -hmm. You know, is it different than how people, uh, re religious religious uh, people, uh, speak of mm -hmm. speak of the future and the, and the present, and even politicians? Right. So that's uh -huh. a long, long first question. <laughs> okay, um, I'll try to answer that. Um, I I think. There is a symbolic quality to poetry that lends it itself to this kind of future founding mode of writing. Because I think it's, it's non-narrative. And I think that kind of allows for the openness that a, a future founding poem needs to, be future, to keep being future founding. I think a novel, for example, or a film, or, or maybe any other medium is putting it bluntly, it's maybe not vague enough or not amb amb ambivalent enough to kind of retain that openness because of its narrative qualities. And I think that's why poetry has this, um, because of the, the inherent ambiguity of the poetic language, it lends itself to a mode that emphasizes openness and play, if you will, and, um, and is oriented towards a, a, a future that can differ from the present. But I, I don't think it necessarily has to be a kind of um, direct statement of a future founding purpose. I mean, Whitman was sometimes really blunt in what he was doing, saying, I am he who's standing the first there. I am making the beginning. There's a, it's a speech act almost. And I, I think um, he, in other poems, he's um, like crossing Brooklyn Ferry. He's more subtle than that. And this idea of a, a future founding poetics is something you can apply and find in other poems as well. Not necessarily in all poems, right? I mean, it's not about poetry that is future-oriented or about the new. That would be too simple. That would just be, you know, just saying the whole thing over and over again using a new term. I think it, we need to be more precise than that. But I think it's, um, it is a certain, a certain trait of poetry that Whitman bluntly put out there and other poem, poets 
like William Carlos Williams, for example, have dealt with more subtly. And it's very much about framing, for example, future perceptions and basically addressing the future in this um, realm between the determined and the, the uncertain. That's the way I would answer it. And I think the political aspect of it is really about how does the individual relate to the society it finds itself in when it comes to its own future and the society, the future of that society. Um, this is a lot more abstract than what politicians are, talk about, are talking about, but of course there is a relation to that. And of course, politicians often invoke the future when it suits them, but of course they also very often do not talk about the future when it doesn't suit them, right? So this idea of sustainability is something that I think hasn't been recognized in poetic discourse as well. It's a long, probably convoluted answer to the question. I'm sorry about that. No, 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 no. It was a, it was a, it was a slightly long and convoluted, sorry. Uh, overly excited question <laughs> on my part. Um, uh, I also wonder about, and you didn't, you didn't, you sort of talked around it um, uh, today, but you, in your writings you talked about the relationship between future founding poetry and crisis, and mm -hmm. certainly bringing up the Civil War and talking about 9-11 makes one right. think that it's somehow in a response to or related to uh, sort of a larger mm -hmm. political, historical, cultural crisis, and maybe right. you could sort of address that. Yeah. Um, that was one of, the, one of the things I realized while working on this, that future founding poetry might be motivated by a certain crisis, because I started with, with Whitman and then immediately addressed 9-11 as well, and that both writings are, are, are really related to a certain events, Civil War with Whitman and 9-11 with many other poets. But then I realized that it's too, it's too simple an explanation, and that it's not like there's a certain event in the world that poets respond to. It's not a, a, a causality involved, that future founding poetry is, needs that event. And I mean, the poets I'm, I'm addressing you could always find this moment of crisis for them, right? I mean, it's just, there's, there's a moment of crisis all the time. And I think I've, I've come up with this, the, well, basically not a, not a solution, but an idea that the future is always in crisis. It's never not in crisis because it's the future, right? That's, it's as simple as that. It's, um, you don't need that cataclysmic event that really threatens to topple your whole world, but the world to come is always in question, and it always needs to be formed. And I think those moments of crisis emphasize that fact a little more. But it's also something that is also omnipresent. And for example, what do you do with the Cold War? You could call that a very prolonged moment of crisis, right? And I mean, so is that, is that something that influenced every poet writing under the threat of the Cold War? How can it not influence anyone? Does it have to be in the poem somehow? It's just not a corresponding relationship where you simply say, ah, sure, Vietnam. Right? You might find that, and it's an example of you know, what motivates maybe future found poetry, but I, um, I find it a too simple an ex explanation, I think. Yeah. Uh, just one more question I'm wondering. You, you talked about um, um, future found, future found uh, the, the notion of future found poetry in relation to modernism. And uh, I wondered about sort of the history of modernism, both in terms of what Whitman was doing before modernism, mm -hmm. but also in terms of how we look at modernism now, and maybe maybe Whitman's example mm -hmm. as a kind of as a kind of um, contrast to you know we have modernism and we have postmodernism and we have right. late modernism, mm -hmm. and it seems as if modernism. Uh, in terms of poetry has become all about, you know, this is the end, the end, the further into mm -hmm. the end, a slight change on the end, you know, right. uh, as opposed to something that's, in, that's con constantly sort of renewing itself, mm -hmm. constantly creating its own, its own uh, future. Yeah. Um, that's a, quite a big question to address, actually. But um, I think Whitman, um, I would call him a modernist for the fact that he was such a beginner, that this is something that he was so much concerned with. And you could, I think, define what modernism is through the sense of beginnings. It is European modernism, American modernism, it's always concerned with beginning and beginning again. I mean, Pound in saying make it new is exactly the summary of that. And the, the whole idea of the manifesto, for example, which is a very modernist form of writing, is about beginning something. It's a statement that says, from now on, we will do this. 
right? Um, unfortunately, they didn't really say what they were doing exactly, but, and you could argue Whitman was writing a manifesto with the first preface to Leaves of Grass in 1855. So I would say that this, if, if he started modernism, which is a bold claim to make and too big a claim, he, in, he introduced that idea to that as well, that the idea of having to begin, and that is a problem that postmodernists have had. How do you transcend the movement that has hijacked the beginning itself? Right? How do you move beyond that? How do you make a beginning? Because if you make a beginning, that makes you modern. So in a way, that's, that's the, the clever thing of modernism, that kind of preempted postmodernism in, in general. Um, and I think looking back on this and how we theorize modernism, I would say that you know, not just because of his innovation and the stylistic experiment and all that, it's that idea of beginnings that really distinguishes him from the, the earlier poems and that makes poets and that makes him more of a modernist to me than, for example, a romantic writer. Uh, is there any questions out there in the audience? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. to make this mad statement over and over again. Mm -hmm. And it's all about the personal insult of being at an end of a life mm -hmm. and being really nostalgic and wanting mm -hmm. to make the, uh, and always talking about beginning, beginning, beginning. Mm -hmm. It's uh, so this contradiction, I think I also see it in modernism, that it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's fetishization of the future mm -hmm. by a, a profound longing for the past. Mm -hmm. um. I, I agree that it's definitely um, a contested field. It's a problem, right? Making a beginning and performing it and even defining it, it's not a simple thing to do, right? I mean, he has this kind of you know, easygoing atmosphere about his style sometimes, but it's a struggle. And you can argue that the struggle will have to fail because he will die, right? And it's, the finality is just something you can't argue away. Right? And that's why it's, it's always a struggle, and that's why maybe future founding as a process is, is the, the important philosophical idea, right? That it's about maintaining that process, and Whitman was trying to maintain it beyond his own death, actually. I mean, a poem like Crossing Brooklyn Ferry is basically another way of writing on a wall saying, Walt was here. That's what he's saying. Now, I, was, I lived too. That's what he's saying. And that is one way of, of basically ensuring his continuity beyond his own death. And I think it's not a selfish thing to do. It's not you know, the artist striving for immortality or anything, but it's simply an imagination of a certain sense of time. And I, I certainly agree that a lot of modernist writing is nostalgic. I would, I mean, for example, The Wasteland, you know, T.S. Eliot, I'm one of the people who really think it's a reactionary, conservative, nostalgic longing for a time when people were still smart. And <laughs> That's, I think that's what he was saying. And I, I think there's other modernists like William Carlos Williams who said, no, that's not really it. I, I, it's not like we all need to learn Provencal to appreciate human culture again. And that's why in the project I'm working on, I'm not using Eliot, even though you could say, well, isn't the wasteland a future founding poem? It's, it's about how do we proceed from here? And I, I think, in a way, it is because it's saying we just need to use all that wonderful old material and recover that again. You could say that's the foundation of the future. And I would agree, but I don't think it's a Whitmanian foundation of the future. It's a nostalgic attempt to found the future on an earlier foundation again. And that's why I would rather look at Williams, who did not go back to these older sources and try to find something in Paterson, for example, in, you know, in America right now. So I, I guess once again, when you talk about an era, you find that it's just you know, too varied and diverse. And I would really say there's a lot of modernists who are nostalgic. And if Whitman influenced one tradition, it's the non-nostalgic one. That's a simplified answer. But I, I certainly agree that we have to take this into account.
I think what, what connects those ideas is that the sense of having to bridge being in one place and not being there at the same time it can be a temporal place or an actual you know, place that you experience. It's about being an individual that lives a certain span of years, but also being a, a part of a society, of a democracy, if you like, that will continue after your death and has been there before you. Or at the same time, being um, in, in living in the mid-19th century and speaking to readers in the 21st. And I think this idea of the ferry is, is combining those aspects really nicely because, of course, he's saying, it's moving, but I'm standing still. And that's why the road was so important for him because being on the road is a really weird state of being because you are on the road, but you're not standing still. You're there, but you're also moving. So this is an essential part of future farming to bridge this being in one place and moving to another and still recognizing that you are in that place. And this is, I think, something that the ferry image allows him to do well. Right? And he never arrives anywhere. I mean, we don't even know where he's going. He's, he's moving, but he's also standing on that ferry. And I think this is, he's using images like that, for example, the road, to kind of give the reader this um, duality, this double sense of, I'm here, but I'm also pretty much there, almost, just quite, right? So, yeah. Any other questions? Right. I think it's a wonderful concept, and you can imagine I'm going to run right back to Shakespeare and <laughs> right. all the Shakespeare plays and sonnets <laughs> and see if I can do anything with it there. When you had the Wynne Thomas quotations yeah. up, the first one was about clouds, and then the second one put me in mind that, and this is something I simply don't know because yeah. we don't know as critics, was Wynne Thomas looking at Whitman as a kind of Icarus figure who flew clo too close to the sun and fell to earth? Let me get back to well that. Later on. Um, um, and, and if so, is this image of Whitman as a kind of Icarus figure something that was prevalent in the quotations? He took flight mm, disastrously to the right, future. Right. That's the one that made me, of course, think of Icarus. Right, and that's true. Is, is there a sense in critics, in the body mm -hmm. of criticism, that Whitman is an Icarus figure? And if so, then... How mm -hmm. would that work into mm -hmm. the whole concept of future founding? Right. Is future founding predicated on the poet's actual physical mortality? And death? Right, right. Um, thank you. That's, that's an interesting thought. I hadn't, hadn't considered that before. I think Thomas is using the image of Icarus to describe Whitman here, but he's not arguing um, in a larger sense that this is the way to understand Whitman. It's, I think it's, it's a metaphor he, he that's, finds apt. And, that's what I heard yeah. from that. Um, but of course, a lot of Whitman criticism is, um, I hesitate to say biographical, but it, it intimately connects the work with the author's life. It does. Mm -hmm. And um, that makes sense up to a point. And I'm not one of, those, one of those critics, really. I don't intend to write his biography by means of future founding. But um, there is this, this argument in that kind of criticism that Whitman um, became increasingly desperate and also about his personal recognition as a poem that America simply did not make him poet laureate, for God's sake, right? And I think he fully expected that. And, and at a certain point, he, he, in 1855, he said that he's working on the new Bible. And he was writing 365 poems, and he said it should be done in, by about 1856. So he <laughs> never quite managed that, but that's, that's the kind of thing he was striving for. And I think so. If if you really do want to apply this idea of the, this would be the romantic poet, I guess, not the modernist poet of really the, the actual person, the self he emphasized so much, striving and then failing. I think, of course, in the end he did fail. He did not write the new Bible, right? But, in, on, on the other hand, he did succeed in ways that. I think those critics are ignoring, and I think that's the important thing, that it's not so much about a definition of success or whether his poetry corresponded to reality. That's not what poetry is about, right? It's not the news, but it's shaping reality, and I think that is the part that those critics are not sufficiently considering. The good critics and the great texts, and I, I really you know, recommend reading them, but I think in that aspect, he needs to be given a lot more credit for the actual political, aesthetic, and social work his poetry is doing beyond the image of the successful poet who is striving for greatness or anything.
think that's a good place to end. Thank you very much, too. Thanks for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.